Hello, I'm Suzanne McGurn. I'm the president and CEO of CADIF, and I'll be moderating the session today. As we get our session underway, I would like to recognize the unique and enduring relationship that exists between Indigenous people and their traditional territories. We acknowledge that we are on the historic and unceded homeland of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people where I am today, just outside of Ottawa. Let this acknowledgement serve as a reminder of our ongoing efforts to recognize, honor, reconcile, and partner with First Nation, Métis, and Inuit people. With humility, I encourage all participants in today's session to continue your own journey to learn and, and, and appreciate and recognize the impacts of colonialization, how each of us and our organization can advance truth and reconciliation and contribute to improved health and self-determination for our Indigenous communities. We launched the CADETH Lecture Series in 2014 so people from across Canada and beyond could hear directly from prominent scholars and opinion leaders about pressing issues facing health uh, health technology assessment and healthcare today. The focus of today's talk is on the impact of COVID-19 on cancer patients, cancer survivors, and their families and health systems across Canada. The COVID-19 pandemic continues to have profound impact on all Canadians, including cancer patients. Some jurisdictions have canceled or postponed early detection and cancer screening, and many have cut back on surgeries and all of them have had to do a pivot to general uh, virtual care in many communities. Taken together, these factors have delayed cancer diagnosis and treatment, which makes it likely that more patients will be treated when their cancers has reached a more advanced stage. And today, our lecture will look at the social, psychosocial impacts on cancer patients, as well as the ethics and economics involved in allocating scarce resources during a pandemic and obviously influencing post-pandemic. Our speaker today is one of Canada's foremost experts in cancer control and cancer survivorship. Dr. Stuart Peacock is a professor and Leslie Diamond Chair in Cancer Survivorship in the Faculty of Health Sciences at Simon Fraser University. He is co-director of the Canadian Centre for Applied Research in Cancer Control, commonly referred to as ARC, and the head of the Department of Cancer Control Research at BC Cancer. Stuart has 30 years of experience in health economics, quality of life research, public engagement, and priority setting in health and public policy. His research interests include developing more effective cancer services, making the health system, making health system funding decisions fairer and more transparent, and improving the quality of life of cancer patients and survivors. For full disclosure, I've known Stuart now for many years, and I've had the great opportunity and pleasure of working with him during his tenure as the academic representative here at CADIS on our board of directors. Stuart, I'm going to turn it over to you. I'm going to remind the audience to put questions in the chat box, and we will come back to questions at the end. And just to let folks know, we will uh, end promptly uh, at one o'clock. So over to you, Stuart. Thank you very much, Suzanne. Can I just check you can see my slides okay? Wonderful, thank you. So thank you so much for the invitation and the opportunity to, to give this talk today. Um, and I want to acknowledge some of my co-authors who worked on various parts of the, uh, the evidence base that I'm gonna to present today, Ryan Woods, Christina Jenai, Helen McTaggart-Cowan and Colleen Bentley. Um, I'd like to start with uh, um, my own acknowledgement, our own acknowledgement of the traditional lands on which we uh, live and work. So I'm coming from a not very sunny East Vancouver this morning. Uh, we are on unceded traditional coastal Salish lands here. Um, that includes the Sahelwatooth, Coquitlam, Squamish and Musqueam nations. I spend some of my week at SFU, I spend some of my week at BC Cancer in different parts of the greater Vancouver area. Um, and I'm going to present some evidence from the global literature on the impact of uh, COVID on cancer and cancer patients. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, patients and families to start with. And I'm going to talk a little bit about health systems. 
I'm going to present quite a lot of evidence today. The slides will be put up on the CADETH website. So if I go through a slide reasonably quickly, there will be opportunities to look at it. And I'm quite happy to take questions outside. Um, I do have to declare that I sit on the uh, BC Ministry of Health Lifetime Prevention Schedule Expert Committee, and I am a member of the Board of Directors of Inspire Health, which is a non-profit integrated care, cancer care provider here in BC. So I've got three or four stock slides, if anyone's ever been to one of my talks before, that I use in pretty much every talk I give, and this is the most up-to-date Canadian cancer statistics. We uh, estimated in 2021 that uh, 230,000 people roughly were diagnosed with cancer. In 2010, around that time, cancer became the leading cause of death in Canada. Uh, two in five Canadians currently will develop cancer in their lifetime. That is gonna change to one in two pretty soon. Most high income countries are heading up to one in two. And this is the reason why. And this is the slide I use uh, most often these days in talks about cancer. Uh, cancer is, to all intents and purposes, a disease of aging. And as your population gets older and we get better at treating things like cardiovascular disease, uh, infectious diseases prior to the pandemic, as your population ages, you get more cases of cancer in the population. That doesn't mean that we're doing things that are more risky to increase the risk of getting an individual getting cancer as such. This is a, an impact of aging and the impact of age on the probability of developing cancer. So the number of cancer cases is rising quite rapidly. This is true in many high, low and middle income countries. Uh, and it's driving uh, an increase in the number of people who will die from cancer as well. So turning to our, our current situation in COVID that we've been living in for a bit over two years now, this is a slide that David Patrick from our CDC uh, uh, graciously provided me with. This is wave one. Uh, and when I was working with Cadith, it was really fascinating listening to the ADMs and the DMs talk about how on January 31st, 2019, their phones started buzzing on New Year's Eve and they started the process of uh, trying to get PPE and the like because uh, the public health people recognised at the point that COVID-19 was going to spread very rapidly indeed. Uh, and we're familiar with phase one. We've lived this for the last little while, but I want to po point out here, March 18, which is an important date, in BC, provincial state of emergency declared and all the things that have followed since then. But the reason I want to highlight March 18 is actually because of a friend and colleague and very well-known patient advocate that I'm gonna talk about in, in a second, uh, Robin McGee. So I want to start this talk with a narrative around patients and families. When I do work in deliberative public engagement, uh, where we talk around different difficult cancer policies and health policy questions with the general public, we always want to introduce a patient first to tell us about the lived experience. And I reached out to Robin last week after a tweet I'm gonna show you on the next slide. And she very graciously uh, gave me permission to share some of her tweets as part of this talk. Um, and uh, Robin is one of the, the bravest people I've run into, I think. Uh, and this charts what's happened since COVID uh, to her. And she developed cancer a number of years ago and been a very passionate cancer uh, advocate, patient and survivor advocate. But on March 19th, the day after, at least in BC, we declared a public health emergency, Robin tweeted, I picked a bad time to get cancer again. And then on March 22nd, she said, it feels like we're all waking up in, in Salvador Dali painting. So here's the metamorphosis of Narcissus that she posted at the time. On April 18, she posted that uh, a, a news item because Robin had such developed a complication from previous treatment called nuclear cataracts. And Robin was going to go blind because of this. And because of the shutdown from COVID-19 and surgery restrictions, her surgery was no longer available to her. Um, some of her good friends and advocates went to bat. And uh, about a month later, you see the CBC story at the bottom there that says blindness averted, Nova Scotian woman secures eye surgery after cancellation caused by COVID-19. But there's a, a tagline at the bottom there that's very interesting for us in Canada because it says Robin McGee will have to pay for the surgery at a private clinic. So there was a twist in the tail still. 
This is Robin going back to chemotherapy in May uh, on May 25, uh, and that's a great picture of what our cancer centres are looking like these days. Uh, it took an emotional, uh, an enormous toll on our patients to have no visitor support uh, in consultations in system in systemic therapy suites. Um, not a uh, a good situation at all. On October 1, she posts, today is her birthday, chemo round number 10. But at this point, she should have been blind and she's grateful that she had the surgery and, and could see again. But this was the tweet that I saw that made me reach out to her just a few days ago. Um, my recent MRI shows that my cancer grew 45% during the months my treatment was delayed and by COVID-19 rela related resource deficits. So that's very recently through Omicron. And then... Uh, to add kind of insult on top of that, uh, a request that some of the people who've been trolling her online uh, would uh, leave her be in peace uh, because we live in this polarized world now where people make unfortunate comments online. Uh, and I thank you, Robin, for doing this. If you ever get a chance, her book that was written pre-COVID is, is a fantastic read. But I thought that gave a really good narrative about how this has impacted uh, our cancer patients. Turning now to uh, a survey that's been undertaken three times by the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network during COVID. And this is a, an organization led by uh, Jackie Manthorne. This is a superb organization. And this uh, survey that they've done is really quite useful. Uh, it's quite an impressive piece of work. The reports that I'm going to show here, a little bit of the data, are from the survey that was done between June 10th and July 4th of this year. And they surveyed a, a, a over a thousand uh, Canadians diagnosed with cancer, a couple of hundred caregivers, and about a hundred people who were in that wilderness between I've got a suspicious finding, but I don't have a confirmed diagnosis yet. You can find details of this survey on the web link there. And I want to show some of the results that they've got here in, in their report. Um, half of our cancer patients who were surveyed continue to have their appointments cancelled, postponed or rescheduled, more so with the recently diagnosed patients and patients at the metastatic stage. So this uh, proportional percentage has come down a little bit since earlier on in the pandemic, but still a tremendous number of our patients are reporting that they've had cancellations or rescheduling to their appointments. And uh, our colleagues in the health system have been working incredibly hard to try and juggle all the competing priorities that we have. And you can see down there as well, they present some data on the proportion of diagnostic tests cancelled, visiting an ER, surgeries and the like. But a lot of cancellations is the message. Next, uh, the next slide I want to, to focus on is um, uh, reports on experiencing delays in starting or continuing treatment. About one in five recently diagnosed and a quarter of metastatic pa stage patients uh, report some kind of change to their care protocol. And I'm going to come back to this uh, later on because the evidence on this one about whether we've had changes in protocol or not is not clear yet. We do know there were some changes, but we're not really sure yet uh, exactly the full nature of, of the types of changes that people had in their treatment. And then this is the last slide from this survey, going to the bottom part first. This is something I'm very passionate about, the, the mental and psychosocial impact on cancer patients and caregivers, uh, the impact of having an appointment postponed or delayed. Uh, on patients, 65% are reporting anxiety, stress, worry, concern, having to put their life on hold. But a clear message that we get in cancer is the caregivers are actually struggling more on psychosocial outcomes. Uh, and this has been borne out by other evidence I've seen. And I'm going to show another slide as well. The caregivers have really found this very hard in terms of the emotional impact, especially when there are delays to the treatment. And then if you look at the panel above that, the main reasons for avoid, avoiding booking an appointment with a doctor, um, you can see that patients one of the main reasons or the biggest reasons is they have concerns about COVID-19 and exposure. Uh, similarly, we know with caregivers, they're really worried about exposing themselves to COVID-19 and then transmitting it to the patient that they're caring for or helping care for. 
And I wanted to dig just a little bit deeper into this particular issue here. This was a survey that came out very early on after wave one of the pandemic. It was done in the US, so this is not Canadian data. But on the right hand side, the, the kind of donut shape there is the reasons why uh, screening tests were canceled or delayed in the US. And the reason I put this slide up here is 42% was the patient saying they did they delayed their test because they had concerns about COVID, for example. 28% uh, was the provider. So it's quite nuanced. Where the delays are coming from, there's a big mix between patient-driven and system-driven. On the other side in the US, and I'm not going to talk much about health equity and inequalities today, but I'm not ignoring it. Um, they've got a lot of data on ethnic background and, and its impact on cancer patients. Uh, and it's really quite concerning when you see black adults are more likely than white adults to have not been scheduled for any cancer screening tests during the pandemic. Uh, and their disparities have been widened. There's no doubts about it during the pandemic. So we see this type of uh, delay in lots of other studies that are, is being published at the moment. We've seen it in the UK, we've seen it in Spain. Uh, I thought the, the Spanish paper talked about uh, women in particular not reporting changes in breast tissue and unexplained bleeding. Lots of people, particularly in wave one, were very, very frightened about going into a healthcare facility, even if they had symptoms and, and chose to defer that. And uh, just last week, the American Association for Cancer Research produced a very big report. Most of it was focused on the impact of COVID on cancer research, which I'm not going to really delve into today. But they did produce some data on uh, cancer patients and systems. So here we have a nice graphic that says, you know, hospitalization rates for COVID-19 patients with cancer were higher than COVID-19 patients without cancer, almost double. 28 day mortality in cancer patients with COVID-19 was higher than cancer patients without, 28% versus 16%. Again, racial disparities in the US, black patients with breast cancer and COVID-19 required mechanical ventilation more than white patients with breast cancer and COVID-19, and a very big jump there. Um, and COVID-19 patients with active ca cancer were much more likely to die uh, than those with no history of cancer. They also in this report uh, generate some quite interesting information, but there's a big caveat to this. So one of the things they tried to do was look at the predictors of mortalities in patients with ca both cancer and COVID-19. And they've suggested a range of things here, like uh, being male, being older, having had cytotoxic chemotherapy recently, um, having progressing versus progressing cancer versus cancer in remission. But what I would say is this is at the moment of kind of weak level of evidence to say that we know this. Uh, I'm involved with a global consortium that we're going to talk about in a minute. When we looked at uh, a systematically reviewed the evidence on this type of uh, this type of issue, what we found was most studies to date uh, are highly biased. They were done very quickly, obviously, because this was a novel pathogen. It's not a criticism to say they were biased. People were just trying to get the evidence and the data out there. And we haven't yet got really high quality evidence of what the predictors of mortality are in cancer patients. These, I would say, are potential candidates and we have some weak evidence. But I do want to put that kind of warning label on this type of evidence at the moment. We're going to need a couple more years studying this, I think. And, and they produced a nice graphic as well around vaccines in patients with cancer. And I thought this was tremendously helpful, actually. This is one of the clearest uh, descriptions I've seen around vaccine advice with cancer patients. So current guidance in most countries, many countries, is for cancer patients to receive recommended doses of approved COVID-19 vaccines. Of course, you've got to discuss the risks and benefits with your healthcare provider when you do this. We do again have some weak to moderate level evidence about how people will respond. So we think that cancer patients with solid tumors and a prior COVID-19 or a prior COVID-19 infection will likely have a high antibody response with the vaccines. But people with blood cancers, stem cell transplant, CAR T therapy, which is an immunotherapy based approach, 
they will have a low antibody response. So we do have big differences between our types of cancer patients and, and vaccine response. We know in lots of countries, we, we don't have strong evidence yet in Canada, but we do in other countries, people's health related behaviors have changed during the pandemic. Alcohol intake is up, smoking is up, all kinds of risk factors that we would expect with, with cancer. And finally, on the patient side of things, I want to mention financial toxicity. Now I'm gonna put a caveat on this. This is a terminology, piece of terminology that's come out in the last five or six years. Um, I trained in health economics. This is medicalizing uh, a, a thing that is not related to someone's cancer and is not a medical condition as such. This is about the high cost of cancer drugs and who pays for them and who doesn't. And that is a health system design issue that is not a side effect of treatment per se. That said, this terminology is used quite widely, and I understand why, because this is about how the uh, high prices of cancer drugs might get transmitted to a patient, so they have to pay out of pocket. And lots of our cancer patients, particularly in the eastern part of the country, have to pay significant amounts for oral chemotherapies, how that will impact them. And what we start to see, and this is particularly big literature in the US, is that there is very definitely an effect from COVID uh, on uh, people's mental health, uh, financial toxicity from trying to pay for cancer drugs. And this was a, a study of women with gynecological cancers and lots of women reporting anxiety because people were laid off, they lost their jobs, cancer diagnosis at the same time, how am I gonna pay for the drugs to, to, to treat this cancer? Just as you'd expect, this is a pretty significant issue. The caveat I put on this is when we talk about financial toxicity, we should talk about health system design at the same time. Okay, so that's my bit on patients and families. I'm going to turn now to the health systems and what it is that we're looking at the implications of COVID-19 for the next 10 and in some cases 20 or 30 years. The way I conceptualize cancer care, this is the diagram that my employer BC Cancer uses to describe uh, the cancer care continuum. It goes all the way from prevention activities through screening and early detection, diagnosis, treatment, which can be survivorship or recovery and survivorship, or coping with the end of life and palliative care. And, and COVID-19 has impacted every part of this continuum. And the work I'm going to present here, because we've got uh, quite a few papers now out of a global modeling consortium called the COVID-19 and Cancer Global Modeling Consortium. This is uh, led by Karen Canfell out of the University of Sydney. It's a fantastic collaboration. It was a great example of how people banded together right at the get-go around COVID. CPAC has partnered, ARC has partnered, um, and I'm going to talk about uh, Talia Malagon's work from McGill, who partnered as well with this. Uh, and we're producing a tremendous amount of good quality research, I think at least, on the impact of COVID on, on different health systems around the world. So I'll draw quite heavily on this consortium. They're kind of focused in three different areas. I've touched on this with the patients and families. What has COVID done in terms of impacting on cancer risk? What has it done to delay diagnosis? And what does that mean for decreased survival? And I'm going to start with screening and early detection, because this, to my mind, is where we have seen the biggest impact of COVID-19. And this impact is going to last now at least a decade. Uh, but we've had really quite profound effects in our screening and early detection programs. And, and a little while back, when I was thinking about the data we were seeing, I started to conceptualize this as what I've called the Mariana Trench problem. So this is this enormous ocean trench that sits out in the Pacific Ocean. The, the deepest part of it is uh, 11,000 meters below sea level. And you've got superimposed there a dotted line that shows Mount Everest. And the data I'm gonna show you shows me two or three things. We've fallen off in terms of early detection and, and screening into the Mariana Trench and then had to claw our way back out of it. But the thing is, once we've clawed our way back out of it, which is the same as climbing Mount Everest, we're still on the sea floor and we haven't got our heads above water yet. Uh, and I'm going to show you lots of graphs that look fairly, fairly similar, depending on where you are in the world. 
So here we go. This is a, a nice Canadian example. This is our colleagues over in Ontario. I've superimposed the, the Mariana Trench up top, just, just for argument's sake. Uh, on the left-hand side, this is the population-based screening mammography program for breast cancer. On the right side is the high-risk program. People have mutations in BRCA1, BRCA2, strong family history. What you see, and this is very uh, common in, in all countries, an enormous drop-off in screening, almost total drop-off because we had to uh, close down much of our screening facilities because we were worried about transmission of an unknown pathogen. Uh, that lasted for two or three months in most jurisdictions, and then we claw our way out of the trench. But the important part about the left-hand graph is we didn't get our head back above water again. The good news on the right-hand side, uh, and this, by the way, is no criticism of anyone in Ontario at all. This is similar and repeated all over, all over the world. On the right-hand side, uh, this is great what, what they've managed to achieve there because they've clawed their way out of their trench and they've got their head back above water. And for the very high risk women that they're screening, they're beginning to catch up with the ones that they missed during the shutdown. Uh, and that turns out to be very, very important. And they produce this for a number of their screening programs. On the left hand side, here's the population based colorectal cancer screening program. And again, similar pan with the increased high familial risk group uh, managed to claw their way much more significantly back out of the trench again. And here's just some of the numbers that uh, they've been using in Ontario, they've developed. Uh, Ontario screening programs, breast, cervical, colorectal, lung cancer delivered almost a million fewer tests compared to 2019. That's an absolutely staggering number. In-person de de tests declined from anywhere between 85% to almost 100%. But one thing I should say, we, and we're being very careful with modeling now, we started out talking about how deep is the trench and, and how long did that go on for? But we also need to be mindful about what are, is the average volume of screening across the entire year of 2020 because of that catch up. Did, did we manage to get our head back above water and did we start to catch back up again? And the, the situation is much less dramatic when you look across the entirety of 2020 compared to just that, that two or three month period. Here we go, getting our heads back above water again, high risk lung and breast exceeded 2019 volumes later on in the year. Uh, delayed diagnosis, about 11% less people reserved a confirmed diagnosis within seven weeks, uh, a seven week period. So big, big effect. One of the, the parts I really like about this Ontario study is one of the few studies in Canada yet that has started to look at what this means for health inequalities and disparities for people who are already disadvantaged. They found that older adults and those from low income neighborhoods are more likely to experience a delay after an abnormal breast, cervical or colorectal screening test. Our First Nation, Meti and Inuit populations are more likely to experience a delay after abnormal screening. Um, and it's essential that pandemic recovery not only restore services to a pre-pandemic state, but focus on equitable access to cancer screening and diagnostic care. Critical issue this, so in terms of health equity, if we've got disadvantaged and higher risk individuals who are less likely to come back into screening after a break, we need to think very carefully about how we can do our outreach and, and make uh, access uh, targeted towards those higher risk, more disadvantaged individuals. And this is unpublished data at the moment. This is a paper we have submitted that Ryan Woods has led. I just wanted to show it so no one in Ontario gets upset with me. This is what's going on in BC. And we have the same trench effect going on in BC. And I can guarantee you this is happening in most places in the world. We, our data showed that screening volumes dropped dramatically for all programs following the onset of pandemic, about 80 to 100% test reductions. We shut down a lot of our, our facilities there for a couple of months. We estimate 11% fewer GU cancers were diagnosed in 2020, that's almost 500. 10% uh, fewer breast cancers, that's 274. And here we go again, this is the American data, and this is a study of Medicare Advantage and private insurance, just to show you that, that everyone went through pretty much the same thing. So I'm gonna come back to a, um, 
diagnosis, early detection, screening, because that, to my mind, is where the biggest challenge lays and, and where we need to do the, the hardest work in, in the coming period to kind of right the ship a little bit. Um, but I do want to talk about treatment. Uh, and, and the evidence is less clear in some places around the treatment than in the screening. So this is a study that came out in, in one of the journal clinical oncology family of journals where they surveyed oncologists in 28 different countries. And they asked them, the figure I've put there is, compared to your previous practice, would you change your treatment algorithms for the following settings during the COVID-19 outbreak? So uh, they've got a whole bunch of different type stages of chemotherapy type treatment or, or cancer therapy treatment uh, and asked oncologists where they thought they would be changing their treatment protocols. Most oncologists thought they would be changing their, their treatment protocols. Anecdotally, when I've spoken to my colleagues, they said, yes, we, we've made some decisions. We, 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 you know, maybe if there's a, a choice of a, an IV systemic therapy versus a take-home oral medication, particularly early on in the pandemic, maybe that we've leaned more towards oral treatment rather than in the hospital IV treatment. But this data is not yet clear and, and colleagues at Sunnybrook have done some work on this and using the admin data sets, they've not found a huge change in, in some of the therapies. There are changes, but at the moment it's not clear to what extent oncologists actually change some of their therapies as, as, part, of the, uh, as part of the pandemic protocols. We do know that surgery is very fragile to COVID-19 lockdowns. Now, a lot of elective surgeries were canceled in a lot of provinces. Many of the cancer surgeries that were being performed though were not deemed elective, so they were going on anyway, but under very difficult circumstances about uh, providing COVID-19 free surgical pathways. But this survey of, uh, or this uh, international study uh, of almost 10,000 patients, 9,000 patients in, in a bunch of different countries, did show that we've had some success at creating these COVID-19 free surgical pathways and that we can prioritize uh, high priority cancer surgery through these pathways and actually have very few post-operative complications compared to, compared to other pathways. But we have had significant disruptions to surgery and that will have affected uh, surgical outcomes or, or, or the timing of surgery for some of our cancer patients. The data from the US, turning back to the American Association from, for Cancer Research report, 64 to 87% of patients with cancer reported delays in their planned surgery at the height of the pandemic. I'm gonna to touch on later on the difference though between wave one and potentially some of the waves that came later on because they were slightly different contexts. Eight to 45 delays in radiotherapy were reported by patients with cancer at the height of the pandemic. 45 day, de, 45 day delay in radiotherapy is clinically very significant to my mind. That's a big delay. Um, 36 to 51% of cancer centers reported a change in uh, plan for chemotherapeutic agents. And there's a whole bunch of other disruptions there. I, I would say I, I'm slightly sad at the moment that we don't have much information on the interruption to palliative care. I think that's an area where we need to do a lot more research on. Palliative care obviously became incredibly challenged by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, here we have some data, 18 to 48% of physicians and ministries reported an interruption to palliative care. Uh, I think there's a, a lot more evidence that will come out in, in the coming months and years around the impact on, on palliative care services. So what do treatment delays mean? in terms of mortality for cancer patients. So our friend and colleague, Tim Hanna in Ontario, uh, very quickly generated this systematic review early on in the pandemic that got published in the BMJ. And this was a great paper and this is a busy slide, but at the bottom, what I want to highlight there is where it says projected additional deaths due to delay. And this is the mortality increases and delay increases uh, and the reference point that we're using here is breast cancer surgery delay for a thousand women. So if you delay the surgery for a thousand women with breast cancer by four weeks, 
you would expect to see an additional 10 deaths within those thousand women. If you delay it by eight weeks, you would expect to see an additional 20 deaths, 12 weeks, an additional 31 deaths. So you can see here, delays in surgery are a clear issue uh, in cancer mortality rates. And these are things that we try and work very hard to avoid. I've got two or three slides on the big Canadian study to my mind so far. This is Talia and her crew from, from McGill. This is part of the global consortium I've been talking about. This is a great paper that they published in the International Journal of Cancer recently with some help from CPAC as well along the way. And uh, Talia has constructed a micro simulation model for all of Canada to look at what happens to patient volumes and mortality for cancer patients um, based on delays due to COVID. So the top graph here is her model's predictions around how surgery and radiation and chemotherapy will behave, the volumes, uh, depending on restrictions due to COVID-19. The bottom graph is, is the observed COVID-19 hospitalizations. So you can see wave one there on the left-hand side of the graph, the Mariana Trench effect again, climbing our way out, but this is with surgery and chemotherapy. And then when we hit wave two and wave three, we've got the modeling results that show this big dip, bump up, big dip again, as we have more restrictions. So modeling the effect of COVID-19 on, on treatment volumes. But then this, these are the two key graphs. What does this mean for incidents and deaths? And on the left-hand side, their model shows this clear drop in cancer incidence as we shut down early detection. Another effect when we get wave one and wave two, big spike coming and we're starting to see this because this is when we reopen the system a bit more uh, and we see all those people who didn't present early on in the pandemic starting to come into the health system. It looks like a less severe graph on the other side, but you can see with the cancer deaths, and this is important, that we have a cancer death curve. Uh, and we're gonna get a spike in cancer deaths that we're expecting to happen this year, and then it will gradually tail off over the next decade. But we are definitely gonna see excess mortality from this. This uh, diagram's a little bit hard to describe quickly, but this is the excess cancer deaths that we expect to see that they modeled. The kind of mid-range shading is the idea that we have no change in our treatment capacity for cancer going forward. Uh, worst case scenario is we'll have a 10% reduction in our capacity to treat cancer patients, or a best case of we need to invest in cancer treatment right now to kind of address this lump of new cancer patients who are arriving in the system who are presenting with later stage disease. And this is flattening the curve. And I'm gonna show one more, more slide about flattening the curve later on as well. In the worst case, we're gonna have a very big jump in the number of deaths due to cancer. Um, in the, the, the intermediate case, we're still going to have a large jump uh, in the numbers of deaths through cancer. If we increase our treatment capacity, we can flatten this curve to a degree uh, and we can avoid some of those deaths. And I want to give you the numbers that they've estimated here. Uh, between 2020 and 30, it's possible based on this model, and this is only one model, but estimated 21,000 more cancer deaths, 2% increase in mortality, assuming treatment capacities return to pre-pandemic levels. I looked up late last night, I just wanted for reference, We've had 35,000 deaths spit over from COVID so far. Um, I never compare diseases, they're not competing. We, we're all trying to have a health system that uh, treats people fairly and equitably, irrespective of the disease you contract. But it was an interesting comparison to try and judge what we're gonna see coming with cancer and, and think about what we've just been through. Uh, and their modeling suggests that this year will be the one where we see the most uh, uh, excess mortality. Now, this is one model, so um, we've all got used to models and predictions at the moment, but I think this is quite instructive and helpful. The last two parts of the talk, I'm going to talk very briefly about, we have a number of projects going on at ARC, uh, both in different provinces and at a pan-Canadian level. I do want to flag this. This was a great initiative by the Canadian Cancer Trials Group that happened right at the get-go of uh, COVID and ARC's been involved with that. This is a 
a prospective cohort study of the impact of COVID-19 on Canadians living with cancer. And this, this study is currently open and still recruiting patients. I want to touch very briefly on a piece of work we've been doing on virtual health because we have a wonderful natural experiment in BC that we've been able to take advantage of. Our Ministry of Health had surveyed about 6,000 cancer patients in BC just before the pandemic and asked them a whole load of questions around PREMS and PROMS. So patient reported experiences, patient reported outcomes. We were lucky enough to be able to sample a few thousand of those individuals again and readminister questions during the pandemic so that we could start to look at what was going on directly before and after COVID-19 hit. Now, we haven't analyzed all of the data yet, but this was too good an opportunity to miss. I do want to do some very uh, preliminary things that we've found so far. This is what you'd expect, and you've seen this in, in all areas of healthcare, uh, the number of telephone visits during the, the pandemic, that top bar there, 71%, whereas it was 43% before. Massive jump in telephone visits. And I think we're all familiar with the fact now virtual health really is a telephone at the moment for lots of people. It doesn't mean a, a video link. We have some video visits. And we have parts of BC, Victoria and Vancouver Island, much better set up, much more experience in this than, than other parts. But what we found with our survey so far, um, one of the strongest findings is there is a relationship between mental health and patient experiences with virtual health. Uh, and quite a strong relationship from what I can see in our initial cut of the data. So we measured it using the VR12, which is actually a, a, a version of the, the SF12, which lots of people will know. And higher scores for mental health were correlated with positive patient experiences and a preference to use virtual health. Um, ease of virtual health on the very first use is a key driver of how patients will respond to that mechanism of delivery of healthcare in the future. Uh, and indicates, you know, if people don't want to use it in the future, it's going to be highly correlated with how their first experience went. Uh, and we have found some evidence that, that men, that people in rural locations and people with higher levels of education have a preference to use virtual health in, in, in the future. What we're trying to do with this is, is work towards a decision aid or maybe a risk selection tool to try and use targeted virtual health for patients who find it an acceptable and good way of delivering healthcare, and perhaps more targeted in-person approaches for those who don't find it uh, effective for them. Uh, and I think it's quite important that we found a relationship here, particularly with mental health and how people perceive the use of virtual health. So here's how do we sum up some of the lessons learned? Uh, and, and bear in mind, this is a moving target. Uh, but I think we're actually deep enough into this pandemic that there are some key learnings already. And I've got some more speculative stuff at the end, which is kind of my musings about what I think some of the, the really neat things are that we might do. The first one, I have to go back to my training in health economics and look at pandemic preparedness, needing economic and ethical frameworks. Uh, because we got the ethical frameworks part right in lots of places in our response to COVID-19, but we didn't actually look at the trade-offs that a health economist would normally suggest they are that, 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 that are there. And this is a slide my, my colleague Craig Mitten has produced, talking about different types of trade-offs we got in different ways. And this just goes up to the fourth wave. It doesn't even do Omicron. Um, but, you know, in the first wave, we had incredible uncertainty and uncertainty, to my mind, was the key thing that defined the first wave. Limited information on the transmission rate, long term care obviously hit incredible hard, incredibly hard, lots of surgical cancellations, shut down the screening program. But then as you go through the waves, the trade offs become bigger in terms of uh, social and economic impacts of lockdowns, people being laid off certain parts of the economy being more affected than other parts of the economy. And one of the things I said to people right at the start of this is you've got to expect there's gonna be civil unrest at some point because we're going into a, a situation where we're potentially putting more controls on society in, in the things they can do than, than some people will, will want to live with. And we've just really seen that mainly in, uh, in, in the last few months. So these trade-offs weren't examined 
Uh, and I think that was a, a bit of a misstep. And I think that's something we need to learn from. Uh, and again, this is one of my slides and I borrowed this from Craig that I put in every, every talk I do. We need to think about the opportunity cost and, and the people who are affected, uh, both that we can see that are very visible, but all the other members of society and how they're impacted. Uh, and I put this slide up here because this is wave one, wave two and wave three uh, as kind of one of my tentative sets of thoughts. I think that in wave one, that we were characterized by uncertainty and we got it just about right in some respects or many respects, applied something along the lines of the precautionary principle that said we're dealing with an unknown pathogen. This could get really bad. This could be hundreds of millions dead if we're unlucky. Uh, we need to put strict social uh, distancing in, strict lockdowns, whatever. I, I feel uh, that, that, that we did a lot of good work around the ethics of doing that. But what I would suggest is by the time we're heading into wave two, we knew a lot more about this pathogen and we knew a lot more about its transmission. Still great uncertainty, but I think in terms of future pandemic preparedness, we need a platform to look at priority setting, opportunity costs and trade-offs that is capable of addressing those as we go forward in any future pandemic, when we start to know a lot more about what it is that we're dealing with because I don't think the precautionary principle is necessarily the right guiding principle when we've got such big trade-offs and we have a better understanding of the disease we're dealing with. And I've got here some of the papers that have come out. Ezekiel Emanuel's uh, great on some of the ethical frameworks, but I wanted to point out to two there, uh, Cam Donaldson, who's a very well-known uh, health economist and Craig, published a, a great paper on uh, the great big marginal analysis and, uh, and the health economics and the emergence from COVID-19. And obviously I'm a little bit biased that, that uh, they asked me to be involved with the next one. Uh, and it's a neat paper in Healthcare Management Forum about how you do prioritization in a pandemic. And as if by magic, um, I got a paper published last week so I can put this one up here. Um, the Ezekiel Emanuel and, and some colleagues from Norway also put out a great paper on the an ethical framework for great global vaccine allocation. And I did want to highlight global vaccine allocations. And I just published a paper two days ago on global public goods and the need for engagement with global citizens on these issues. And I, we need to do a tremendous amount of work on vaccine allocation in the future. So we need to flatten the cancer incidence curve. And I'm going to show you a curve in a minute. This comes from a different paper on, on, from Lancet Gastro, Gastroenterology and Hepatology. In uh, using the models that we're using in this consortium, these models predicted that we would get an additional 1,300 deaths from uh, different colorectal cancers in the next 20 to 30 years. So a substantial jump. And just as I was showing earlier, this is a scenario using models in four countries. Canada's right at the right end here. If we have the base case where we just reopen our programs and do no catch up on the people that we missed during the shutdown, we're gonna get a substantial heightening of the curve. There's gonna be a substantial number more colorectal deaths. If we do something called immediate catch up and we plow resources into the system and try and flatten the curve, that's the blue line. Uh, and that's what I mean by flattening the cancer incidence and mortality curve. We need a concerted effort and we, we need it right now and people are working on it to try and flatten this curve going forward. We need to optimize recovery strategies for high risk groups. And this is a paper, I'm drawing an example from HPV that came out in Lancet Public Health. Uh, when we do our uh, catch up or try to catch up on our diagnosis uh, of cancers, we need to prioritize groups that are at high risk of developing that disease. So the easiest one we found in HPV was age. We should be deprioritizing women in age groups in which risk from missed cancer screens is low. But also, if we have the data available in different settings, we've got good evidence to show that we should be prioritizing or deprioritizing based on whether they've had recent screens, whether they've been vaccinated and the like. So there's nuance and subtlety to how we catch up in our screening programs. And there are many, many more lessons and this is gonna be my final slide. These are some of my musings and, and some of the good things that might've come out of COVID-19. 
Um, I think there's some growing evidence to, to suggest that we should use greater use of mail out fecal immunochemical tests for colorectal cancer screening. With social distancing, this worked quite well in a number of jurisdictions. We have a bit of a problem with capacity for colonoscopy in many provinces. Uh, the screening programs are going to struggle, not just because of the screen themselves, but because of all the investigative parts of the process that flow on for abnormal results. Colonoscopy is one of the big ones. Making greater use of self-collection for HPV testing. This is a real positive that's come out of COVID-19. It is beginning to look like self-collection for HPV testing is a viable methodology, and particularly in low and middle income countries, there's a lot of excitement about this. Uh, make significant investments in psychosocial interventions. I am extremely passionate about this. The mental health impacts of COVID-19 on cancer patients, survivors, their families have been enormous. When things get tough in the cancer sector, quite often this is the area that gets cut back. And this is not the time to cut back on psychosocial interventions. This is the time to invest in it. And, and, and as I say, I'm quite passionate about this. Um, we need to do things like use machine learning to read pathology reports, because it takes about a year for us to confirm a cancer case in our cancer registries. And internationally, every single country I've spoken to has recognized that that is too long of a time and we need to speed that up. And another just nice one from the, the uh, HPV testing, we repurposed a whole bunch of reagents and platforms from uh, HPV testing and vaccination towards uh, COVID-19 right at the start. But actually, now we've got lots of capacity. And if COVID-19 dies back a little bit, uh, as we try and end cervical cancer in this country, there may be some great opportunities for repurposing platforms that we have there. So, Suzanne, uh, that's my last slide. Thank you very much. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, lots of uh, lots of thought provoking uh, parts of that presentation. I certainly loved your um, comparison to the Mariana Trench. And to be fair, I don't want to go deeper into COVID uh, to gain further uh, learning, but uh, uh, that's a personal bias. Just before we kick off the questions, we only have about five minutes, so we won't be able to get through them all. I do just want to recognize um, some information that was put in the chat under answered questions from Kathy Oliver from the um, International Brain Tumor Alliance, IBTA, uh, with some references and would encourage people to, to look at those responses and visit their website. Um, but maybe, Stuart, where I'll, I'll start a couple of questions is, um, you touched a little bit on the, uh, there's a, a question about mental health and you touched on it a little bit in your closing remarks, but there's a couple of questions about sort of the future looking forward and uh, they're quite specific. So I'll just read them out to you and you can share what you, your immediate response is or if, if it's something you're familiar with. So will resource shortages impact the rollout of lung cancer screening in provinces that have initiated low dose CT screening? And looking at the figures you've presented, do the absolute, you know, do you have what an absolute increase in 10% capacity would look like in dollars? And is it actually achievable? Both, both very good questions. Unfortunately, I can't answer them definitively. Um, yes, I'm aware a number of provinces are rolling out uh, lung cancer screening. I, I, I remain optimistic with that type of uh, issue that if the ministry has already made the decision and committed the funds that the rollout should work reasonably well it's just the uh things are taking everything in the health system is taking longer because of covid than it would have done otherwise so i i feel quite positive about that very good question about the uh what does a 10 percent uh increase in capacity looks like in terms of budget um i, th I think that's something we need to work on i haven't seen those estimates yet it's not going to be a trivial amount of money. It's going to be, uh, and, and with the amount of competing demands, it's very challenging, but yeah, it'll be big. Um, actually, an interesting follow-up question that I'll just make as a comment to you, it's for you to take away. You know, has there been any uh, reflection on whether the cost savings to the health system due to the reduction in cancer treatment through the multiple waves could be used to support reinvestment uh, to address those um, challenges. So uh, a, a good response. One last question before I go to closing, um, uh, Stuart, and it is, 
you know, what role, in your opinion, could uh, CADETH or other HTA organizations play, uh, given that oncologists may well have modified treatment selection? Um, what are, you know, what are your thoughts going forward about things that HTA agencies may want to be alert to? I, I think we have an opportunity to study uh, real world data and administrative data to see if we can tease out what the changes were and what the resource implications of those changes were, but critically what the, the change in outcomes for patients were. So it's a, an unfortunate natural experiment. And I think an agency from like Cadeth could leverage some of those data to see what learnings we got out of it. Because um, there will be learnings no, no, no matter what we've done. Thanks, Stuart. And I will say that uh, I, I really did enjoy the uh, presentation. Um, had so many things to talk about. Um, so I, I know for all of the uh, well over 300 participants on the call right now, it will spur further conversation and uh, research. I, I would just want to acknowledge, you know, one of the things that really struck me as you went through your slides, the thoughtfulness and the continued efforts of researchers across Canada and internationally uh, during what was a very difficult time for, for many individuals and that continued commitment to science during COVID um, will serve us well during COVID and will serve us well into the future. So before we close off, Stuart, um, what would you like to leave us as a parting thought? Well, I, I, I think, um, you know, building on what you've just said there, there's been a remarkable resilience in the community. Um, we need to be very thoughtful about how we prepare for the future in the next 10 years, uh, and also the, the possibility that we might have another pandemic. We've learned an awful lot, but I, I think we've, people, and particularly our patients and survivors, have shown a, a remarkable degree of resilience through this. So thank you, Stuart. That does bring us to the end of today's session. I would like to extend a huge thank you to our guest lecturer, Dr. Stuart Peacock, for his talk today. These talks do not come without a lot of preparation uh, and thoughtfulness. So thank you, Stuart. I just also want to thank everyone that did tune in today for today's lecture. Um, your um, listening and taking away the learnings from today can't help but improve the health systems, um, not just here, but internationally. And I just want to flag that there will be a short evaluation survey that will open in a new window when you exit Zoom. Please do take a moment to fill it out. And until the next time, um, continue to follow safety protocols to protect yourself, your loved ones, and your communities. And I hope the next time that we're having this conversation, uh, we're actually seeing us climb out of Mariana's Trench and above the seafloor. So thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of your day wherever you are. Take care.